Before we get into the 70s, I want to start by bringing you from the 1960s. Before we get into the 70s, it's only right that I start you with the 1960s. Okay? Okay? So on February the 9th of 1965, the good Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. met with President Lyndon Baines Johnson in the White House. On February the 21st, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X, the greatest since Garvey, was assassinated. A collaboration between jealous Negroes in the organization and the United States power structure. Now, on March the 7th of 1965, we have the first march from Selma to Montgomery that was stopped by the police. So Malcolm is murdered on February the 21st of 1965. And then the very next month on March the 7th, we have the very first Selma to Montgomery march as part of the civil rights movement. Okay? And then on March the 8th, I want y'all to pay attention to this. We're in the late 60s right now. We're in the late 60s right now. On March the 8th, three weeks, three weeks after they murdered Malcolm, three weeks after the FBI murdered Malcolm, Lyndon Baines Johnson passes the Law Enforcement Assistance Act. I want y'all to understand, overstand, and understand this. March the 8th of 1965, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Law Enforcement Assistance Act. Okay? This act would give the federal government a direct role in local police departments for the first time in American history. I'm going to say it again. March the 8th of 1965, three weeks after they murdered Malcolm, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Law Enforcement Assistance Act, which gave the federal government a direct role in local police operations in the black community throughout the entire country. Okay? Now, the Law Enforcement Assistance Agency created the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, which would be housed in the Department of Justice and would become the fastest growing federal agency in the government. The budget for the Law Enforcement Assistance Agency went from $10 million in 1970 to $850 million by 1985. I want y'all to pay attention to this. I want y'all to pay attention to this. I want y'all to pay attention to this. Hang on one second, Facebook. So, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration would be the branch of the government that would be used to infiltrate all black nationalist organizations after Malcolm's assassination. And the government would swell their budget from $10 million in 1970 to $850 million by 1985. The purpose of the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration was to prevent the rise of a black messiah after Malcolm. What they did was they gave the police in the black community military-grade surveillance equipment and military-grade weapons equipment. I want y'all to understand this. The federal government, right after they murdered Malcolm, 
They empowered the local police department in every black community with military grade surveillance equipment and military grade assault weapons. I need y'all to understand this. I need y'all to understand this. I need y'all to understand this. Part of the reason they did this right after they were murdered Malcolm, part of the reason they did this right after they murdered Malcolm is because they feared a strong urban revolt by American Africans as a act of revenge for the assassination of Malcolm X. So right after they killed Malcolm X, they immediately started giving money to the police departments so that they could suppress any attempt by black youth to avenge Malcolm's death by attacking the power structure or its institutions, brothers and sisters. Okay? The Law Enforcement Assistance Administration sponsored over 80,000 crime control projects. It sponsored over 80,000 crime control projects and the goal was to expand supervision and control of the black community. So this is COINTELPRO on a whole new level. This is COINTELPRO on a whole new level. Then, on June the 7th, 1965, the United States Supreme Court makes abortion fully legal. On June 7th, 1965, the United States Supreme Court made abortions fully legal across the country. Why did the Supreme Court, in the summer of 65, why did the Supreme Court, in the summer of 65, cancel all arguments against abortion because you just had the civil rights bill of 64 and the voting rights act of 65 black people appeared as if they were going to be included into the american social structure and to prepare for that they had to make sure they could give black women as many abortions as possible. They had to make sure that Planned Parenthood could continue to operate in the black community. So the Supreme Court outlawed abortion in 65, okay? Right after they murdered Malcolm, a few months later. Then, in August 8th of 65, August the 8th of 1965, the Voting Rights Act would be signed into law by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. But what black people failed to understand, what black people failed to understand was even though you got the right to vote on August the 8th of 1965, on March the 8th, March the 8th, April, May, June, July, five months before the Voting Rights Act, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Law Enforcement Assistance Act. Five months before the Voting Rights Act, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Law Enforcement Assistance Act. So while black people were celebrating the right to vote unencumbered, your government was empowering your police to destroy the black community. While you were being given the right to vote, while you were being given the right to vote, the police were being empowered to undermine your ability to resist governmental oppression. While you were being given the right to vote, the government was empowering the police in your neighborhood to undermine your ability to fight against racism. Then on January the 12th of 1966, Batman and Robin TV series appears on television for the first time. January 1966, Batman and Robin TV show appears for the first time. Why am I bringing that up? Why is Dr. Umar bringing up the Batman and Robin TV show on January the 12th of 1966? The reason I'm bringing that up is because one of the themes you're going to learn when we go through the 1970s. One of the themes you're going to learn about as we go through the 1970s is that the government deliberately, 
used television to distract black people away from the political agenda. Stay with me. I want you to understand, overstand, and understand. In the 1960s and the 1970s, the U.S. government would use television to distract black people away from the political agenda of the United States government. Cartoons. Cartoons really began to make a headway into American daily life in the late 60s and early 70s. Cartoons really began to make a headway into American life in the late 60s and 70s to distract black people and to distract black children away from their political agenda. And then they started using video games to distract black people and black children away from the political agenda. And now they use social network to distract black people away from the political agenda. So we have to watch how media, we have to watch how media from radio to TV to music to social network, video games have been used to distract black people away from the political agenda. They pass laws every day in this country to disenfranchise black folks. There's, there are laws passed in every state every day to disenfranchise black folks. I'm willing to bet there's not a day, there's not a day that goes by where one of the state legislatures of this country, there's not a day that goes by without at least one of 50 state legislatures passing a law to disenfranchise black folks every day. But they don't put it on the news because they don't want you to be aware of what they're doing to disenfranchise you. So what they do is they put that TV in your face and they use cartoons, reality shows, talk shows, movies, and they distract you from your reality. Go into any ghetto you want. In the average black ghetto resident has a $300 cable bill. They got every cable channel. They got every cable channel. Black people spend more money on cable TV than any other group. We spend more money on cable TV than any other group. And do you know why that is? We want to be distracted. Not only is the government distracting you, not only is the government distracting you, you want to be distracted because you do not want to take responsibility for your own liberation. Black people are allergic to organization. Black people are allergic to the acquisition of power. Black people are allergic to building our own institutions. So although the government is distracting you with media, you want to be distracted by media because you do not want responsibility for your liberation. The average black person to be liberated will require the U.S. government to do it for them. The average black person to be liberated will require the U.S. government to do it for them. Let's continue. So Batman and Robin hits the televisions in January of 66. And then on January of 66, the prime minister of Nigeria is assassinated, triggering a civil war between our Yoruba African brothers and our Igbo African brothers that will last three years. It's one of the worst civil wars to take place on American soil. I'm going to say it again. 1966 in Africa, the Nigerian prime minister would be assassinated, which triggered a civil war between our Igbo African brothers in Nigeria and our Yoruba African brothers in Nigeria. And it is a war that would separate nations in Nigeria from one another. And then on January 17th, 1966, Dr. King opens up his Chicago campaign. Dr. King moves to Chicago to expose racism in the North. Okay? 
the next year after they killed Malcolm, right? So you get Malcolm's murder. You get the Law Enforcement Assistance Act. You get the Voting Rights Act. You get Batman and Robin. And then you get Dr. King going to Chicago to start his Chicago campaign in January of 66. And then on March the 11th of 1966, three men are convicted for killing Malcolm X, but two of them were innocent. On March the 11th, 1966, three men are convicted for the murder and assassination of El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, but two of them are innocent. And then also in 1966, May 14th, Stokely Carmichael, great Pan-Africanist Kwame Ture, is elected the national chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and he would popularize the phrase that the most honorable Marcus Garvey actually created, which is black power. Stokely Carmichael got on the microphone and said, we want black power. Stokely Carmichael, the great Pan-Africanist, the last of the great Pan-Africanists, got on the microphone and said, we want black power. This is one year after Malcolm's murder. And then in June, June the 13th of 1966, the Supreme Court ruled that your Miranda rights must be read before you are questioned by the police. June 13th. 1966, the United States Supreme Court said, police must read you your Miranda rights before they question you. If the police don't read you your rights before they question you, the case could potentially be thrown out. That was June 13th of 1966. Okay. And then September the 6th, of 1966, Puerto Rican women, our African Bariqua queens, Puerto Rican women, our African Bariqua queens, Puerto Rican women in Puerto Rico, most of them Afro Ricans, would be used as research guinea pigs for Mar Margaret Singer and Planned Parenthood birth control pill. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. In September of 1966, the U.S. government under the leadership of Planned Parenthood would go into Puerto Rico and they would test the birth control pill on thousands of African Puerto Rican sisters on the island of Puerto Rico. And many of them did not know that the birth control was being birth control pill was being tested on them. And then the birth control pill gets approved on June 23rd, 1960. The birth control pill is approved in 1960, and they tested it on Puerto Rican women. The founder of uh, Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, she died on September 6, 1966. Thank God. Margaret Sanger, the mother of, of eugenics, Margaret Sanger, who started Planned Parenthood, she died in September of 1966. But the birth control pill was approved in 1960 and they tested it on African Puerto Rican women in Puerto Rico. October 15th, 1966, the Black Panther Party is founded in Oakland, California by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale. October 15th, 1966, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense is founded in Oakland, California by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale. I love the Black Panther Party from yesterday. I love the Black Panther Party from yesterday. I love the new Black Panther Party too, but we talking about the original Black Panther Party, those brothers. The original Black Panther Party, those brothers was in their teens and early 20s. 18 and 19 and 20 and 21, they were babies. And the Black Panther Party started a social revolution. They were the most militant black group in American history, second only to, or should I say third, to the Marcus Garvey African Legion, okay, and the Deacons for Defense. 
the Marcus Garvey African Legion, the Deacons for Defense, and the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense are the three most militaristic organizations in American history. The three most militaristic organizations in American history. I didn't mention in fact. All due respect to the not effing around coalition. All due respect to the not effing around coalition. But the reason I'm not mentioning in fact, and I respect in fact, let's keep it a buck. I respect all black organizations. Okay. But the reason I don't include in fact on that short list of Marcus Garvey's African Legion, the Deacons for Defense, and the, and the Black Panther Party for Self Defense is in fact never never went to war with the white power structure. That's the only reason why. I'm not saying they won't go to war with the white power structure, but in fact has never faced off with the white power structure in an armed conflict. The African Legionnaires, they had shootouts with the KKK. Marcus Garvey's African Legionnaires, they had shootouts with the police. Deacons for Defense, they had shootouts with the KKK. Deacons for Defense, they had shootouts with the police. Black Panther Party had shootouts with the police. In fact, has never went to war for black people. I'm not saying they're not ready to. Don't misrepresent what I'm saying. But they cannot get on that list, okay, until they demonstrate a history of resistance, direct confrontation with the oppressor, as did Marcus Garvey's Legionnaires, the Deacons for Defense, and the Black Panther Party. Much respect to NFAC. Moving on. Moving on. So the Panthers are founded in October 15th of 1966. And then on December the 26th, look at this now. Two months after the Black Panther Party is founded. Two months after the Black Panther Party is founded. Dr. Milana Karenga holds his first Kwanzaa celebration. Two months after the Black Panther Party is founded in Oakland, Milana Karenga holds his first Kwanzaa celebration, December the 26th, 1966, the birth of Kwanzaa. Now, as you know, there was a history between the Black Panthers and Milana Karenga's United Slaves. And I don't profess to know every detail of it. But there's people who allege that Dr. Milana Karenga was an agent for the power structure. I can't confirm it. I can't disconfirm it. And I don't believe in convicting anybody, especially an elder, unless you have proof that he was an agent. Okay? As you know, our Prentice Bunchy Carter and John Huggins would get killed on the campus of UCLA, I believe it was by members of M Milana Karenga's organization. Some people say COINTELPRO was involved. Some people say Milana Karenga was an agent. I don't know. I can't speak to that. Until I have conclusive proof, I can't mess with that. I met Dr. Karenga when I keynoted the Black Consciousness Conference at Cal State Long Beach, largest attendance in their history when I spoke. Okay. But I'm not going to throw the elder under the bus without sufficient proof. Okay? Now, I honor Kwanzaa. I participate in Kwanzaa occasionally. My issue with Kwanzaa, in retrospect, this is not an attack on the brother Dr. Milana Karenga, but the, 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 the constructive criticism of Kwanzaa, because we can fix this, but my constructive Criticism of Kwanzaa. Uh, oh, I got a lot of records, my sister. I've broken a lot of records. St. Martin, when I keynoted, it was the largest, most attended black history event in the history of that island since they started holding black history money events. Oh, I got some records. I've broken many records around the world. Okay, but let's stay focused uh, because I'm humble. I am extremely humble. Let's stay focused. My constructive criticism for Kwanzaa, my constructive criticism for Kwanzaa is that I don't think it should have been during the Christmas holiday season. 
My constructive criticism for the Kwanzaa holiday is I don't think Kwanzaa should have been put in the American Judeo-Christian holiday season. I know why he did it to give us an alternative. I know why he did it to give us an alternative. But the reason why I don't think Kwanzaa should be celebrated when it is celebrated is because, number one, it's after Christmas. So it's not really competing because it's after Christmas. But on top of that, after black people have spent millions of dollars on Christmas gifts, after black people have spent millions of dollars on Christmas gifts, they now got seven extra days of Christmas. Kwanzaa is not Christmas. Don't get me wrong. But because we like the shop and because American capitalism has exploited Kwanzaa for personal gain. Because we like the shop and because American capitalism has exploited Kwanzaa for personal gain. Because we like the shop and because American capitalism has exploited Kwanzaa for personal gain. Kwanzaa becomes an extra seven days for the white man to make money off the black man. If I'm lying, prove it. If I'm lying, prove it. Kwanzaa has become an extra seven days for the white man to make money off the black man. Look at how much money we spend on Christmas and then look at all the money we spend from Christmas to New Year's. Have you noticed that a lot of these stores have all these post-Christmas sales? Post-Christmas sales. So you can go and buy Kwanzaa gifts. That's right. You can go into Macy's and they selling Kwanzaa products. One of the mistakes that was made with Kwanzaa is we did not keep it an all black holiday. One of the mistakes made with Kwanzaa, we did not keep it an all black holiday. Much respect to my elder Dr. Karenga. Much respect to my elder, Dr. Karinga. But when Dr. Karinga said that non-Africans can participate in Kwanzaa, when he said that non-Africans can participate in Kwanzaa, respectfully, he said they can't lead it. They can't lead it. He did clarify they can't lead it, but he said they can participate. Once he allowed the aliens to participate in Kwanzaa, you automatically dilute the power and the spiritual ashe of Kwanzaa. That's why Joe Biden made Juneteenth a federal holiday. This is why Joe Biden made Juneteenth a federal holiday. We were already celebrating Juneteenth. We didn't need Joe Biden to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. We were already celebrating Juneteenth, but the reason Joe Biden wants to make Juneteenth a federal holiday is the same reason the government endorsed Kwanzaa and they celebrate Kwanzaa in the White House and they have a Kwanzaa stamp at the post office is to integrate and disintegrate. You integrate it and then you exterminate it. You integrate Kwanzaa, you exterminate Kwanzaa. You integrate Black History Month, you exterminate Black History Month. You integrate Dr. King's birthday, you exterminate it. You integrate Juneteenth, you exterminate it. We must continue to celebrate Juneteenth as an African holiday in America. And it must be exclusively African. I'm going to say it again. Learn from Kwanzaa. Learn from Black History Month. Have you all noticed that in the Obama era, even before Obama, but especially since Obama became president, Black History Month no longer carries the same power and respect? Kwanzaa no longer carries the same power and respect? Dr. King Day no longer carries the same power and respect? And now Juneteenth. Watch Juneteenth next year. Mark my words. Mark my words. Watch what they do with Juneteenth next year. It's going to be so integrated. It's going to get misdirected. The Rainbow Gang is going to take it over and exploit it. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you what Juneteenth 2022 is going to look like. 
They going to have every other race participating in Juneteenth. The Rainbow Gang is going to turn it into a day for them. It's, we're going to end up celebrating everybody instead of black liberation. We're going to end up celebrating everybody instead of black liberation. Listen, one of the best things that ever happened was for Malcolm X's birthday not to become a federal holiday. One of the best things that ever happened was for the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, the preeminent prophet and king of pan-Africanism and black leadership. The best thing that ever happened was for... Uh, Mr. Garvey's birthday to not become a holiday. One of the best things that ever happened was for Malcolm's birthday to not become a federal holiday. You know why? If Malcolm X's birthday was a federal holiday, it would have already been colonized and exploited by alien groups. Best thing that ever happened. Joe Biden made Juneteenth a federal holiday so he can kill it. So he can kill it. We better keep Juneteenth all black. Let me explain something to y'all. If you don't keep it to yourself, it's not sacred. Do you know what the word sacred means? I want you to understand, overstand, and understand me. Do you know what the word sacred means? When something is sacred, it is off limits. When something is sacred, it is off limits except for the purpose in people who it is intended for. When something is off limits, you don't walk into a Jewish synagogue if you're not a European Jew. You don't walk into a Chinese church if you're not Chinese. You don't walk into no Buddhist temple if you're not a Buddhist. You're not going into no Irish Catholic mausoleum if you're not an Irish Catholic. And when you get in there, you're going to participate in the activities the way that they were designed by that culture. You don't see Jewish holidays getting exploited by McDonald's and Wendy's. You don't see Chinese holidays getting exploited by Walmart and Macy's. The only people who holidays get exploited by Western capitalism is black people because we don't believe in anything sacred. Nothing black is sacred. Nothing is sacred. Our traditional African spiritual systems and I'm an Ifa devotee, but our traditional African spiritual systems, but I'm an Ifa devotee. Our traditional African spiritual systems, they have been infiltrated by alien groups. What are you doing with white priests in African traditional spiritual circles? What are you doing with white priests in African traditional spiritual circles? What is wrong with us? They didn't stole our men, stole our women, stole our land, stole our resources, stole our freedom, stole our independence, stole our inventions. And now you're going to let them steal our spirituality. Even African spirituality is in sacred. There is nothing in black America that is hands off to non-African people. There is nothing in black America that is hands off for non-African people. Everybody has something sacred in this country except us. Nothing is sacred. And I speak for the whole Pan-African diaspora. I speak for the whole Pan-African diaspora. I speak for the whole Pan-African diaspora. We ain't got no place or no thing that aliens can't come in and participate in or use. Nothing. Name something that is sacred for African people that only African people can touch, use, or do. Name it. Name it. You can't give me anything. You can't give me nothing on the planet Earth that is so sacred to us, we won't let white folks see it. We won't let them touch it. We won't let them buy it. We won't let them join it. We won't let them participate in it. That is a problem. A people who don't have anything sacred are a people without respect. A people who don't have anything sacred are a people without respect. No other culture but ours. But getting back to my point, Kwanzaa is being exploited by white capitalism specifically because it is in the Christmas holiday season. It's an extra seven days of Christmas. No disrespect, Dr. Karinga. I want you to understand, overstand, and understand your younger brother. 
I'm not dissing Kwanzaa. I'm saying that where Kwanzaa is placed on the, on the calendar makes it particularly susceptible for exploitation by corporate interests. What I'm saying is when you said people can participate in Kwanzaa who are not Africans, Kwanzaa was no longer sacred. That's what I'm saying. We still going to celebrate it. We still going to honor it. Psychologically, it is important for African people to have that time. I just wish we would have put it at another time of the year. And I wish we would have never said non-Africans can participate. They integrate and they exterminate. Juneteenth is next if we fall for the okie doke. Getting back to the timeline. I'm giving y'all the timeline. Now let's go to 67. On May the 2nd of 1967, Bobby Seale and little Bobby Hutton storm into the California State Assembly representing the Black Panther Party to protest the Mulford Act, which banned the open carry of rifles in California. So on May the 2nd, 1967, little Bobby Hutton, who would become a martyr Little Bobby Hutton, who would become a martyr to black youth around the world before Trayvon, before Brianna, before Tamir, before Sandra, before Walter Scott, before Eric Garner, before Philando Castile, before all of those Africans, rest in peace to all of them. Bobby Seale was murdered by the police in Oakland. Excuse me, not Bobby Seale. Take that back. Bobby Seale is still alive. Little Bobby Hutton. Little Bobby Hutton. Little Bobby Hutton. The youngest founding member of the Black Panther Party. Little Bobby Hutton. The youngest original member of the Black Panther Party was murdered by the police. But that was after him and Bobby Seale stormed into the California State Assembly on May the 2nd, 1967, to protest Governor Ronald Reagan, to protest Governor Ronald Reagan in the Mulford Act that was going to ban the Panthers from carrying the open rifles. And then on May the 22nd, 1967, the great poet Langston Hughes dies. And you know, Langston Hughes' grandmother used to be married to one of the five Africans who stood with John Brown at the Harpers Ferry Raid in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia on October the 16th, 1859. And then the 1967 riots happened. And then the 1967 riots happened. And then the 1967 riots happened. July 23rd, 1967, Detroit, Michigan. July 23rd, 1967, Detroit, Michigan. July 23rd, 1967, Detroit, Michigan kicked off the most intense, the most rebellious, the most revolutionary urban riot in American history belongs to Detroit, Michigan. Motown set it off. Motown set it off. Shout out the black Detroit. Shout out the black Detroit. Detroit had the most revolutionary inner city riot in American history. History between July the 23rd and July the 28th in Detroit, Michigan, there was 483 fires, 43 people were killed, 696 wounded, 7,200 people was arrested. But this is the thing about Detroit. This is the thing about Detroit. When the army came into Detroit, our brothers and sisters in Detroit fought back against the U.S. Army. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. When the military came into Detroit to occupy the hood, our brothers and sisters in Detroit, Michigan, stood up to the tanks and the soldiers, and they went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, bullet for bullet, and gun for gun with the white power structure. They didn't tell you about this in that movie called Detroit. They didn't tell you about this in that movie Detroit. 
They showed you the police brutality, but they didn't show you how the Africans in Detroit stood up to the U.S. Army in the 1967 riots. And one of the reasons that Detroit, Michigan has never been rebuilt just like Haiti, just like Haiti just like our Haitian African brothers and sisters in the Caribbean. One of the reasons the city of Detroit has not been rebuilt is America is still angry at the Africans of Detroit for standing up against the U.S. military when they came in to occupy. We didn't beat the military, brothers and sisters, but we gave them a run for their money. Those brothers and sisters did not lay down. When the tanks came, they stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the tanks and the soldiers, and that's why they don't want to rebuild Detroit, because they're afraid that if you rebuild Detroit, you will make black people stronger than they ever been, and that's why we got to hold on to Detroit, and that's why we can't give up Detroit, and that's why we cannot allow Detroit to be gentrified, brothers and sisters. Listen to this. According to the U.S. government, according to the United States government, according to the United States government, the Detroit riot of July 1967 was the worst riot in American history since the 1863 New York City Civil War draft riots. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. According to the U.S. government, the Detroit riots of 1967 was the worst riot in American history since the New York City 1863 Civil War draft riots, brothers and sisters. That's how revolutionary Detroit was. That's how revolutionary Detroit was. And if you get a chance to go to Detroit, make sure you go to the museum. I'm forgetting the name of the Detroit Museum. Lord have mercy. They did have an exhibit on the Detroit riots. A very good exhibit was in the Museum of Detroit, the African American Museum in Detroit, which I believe is the largest in the country. Okay, they have a whole exhibit on the 1967 Detroit riots. Okay, and the Detroit riots would not be surpassed until the 1992 Rodney King riot. The Detroit riots would not be surpassed until the 1992 Detroit riots and the D, excuse me, 1992 Rodney King riots in L.A. But the Detroit riot was so revolutionary that Lyndon Baines Johnson invoked the 1807 Insurrection Act to put down the Detroit riot. Did y'all hear what I just said? Lyndon Baines Johnson invoked the 1807 Slave Time Insurrection Act in order to put down the Detroit riots, my brothers and sisters. Hit the cash app, dollar sign FDMG school. Hit the cash app, dollar sign FDMG school. Hit the cash app, dollar sign FDMG school. Yes, the Detroit riot. Who was second to the Detroit riot? The second most revolutionary riot in American history was the Newark, New Jersey riots of 1967. Shout out to black Newark, New Jersey. Shout out to Newark, New Jersey. Shout out to Newark, New Jersey. Detroit and Newark, New Jersey were the twin towers of black resistance in the post Malcolm X era. Detroit, Michigan and Newark, New Jersey were the twin towers of black resistance in the post Malcolm X, El Hodge, Malik El Shabazz era. Let's keep on going. And do you know how the Detroit riot started? And do you know how the Detroit riot started? The Detroit riot started when the police raided an after hours bar. The police raided an after hours bar and decided to arrest brothers and sisters who wasn't doing nothing but having a drink. And those brothers and sisters in Detroit, they don't play that white supremacy shit. They don't play that police brutality. They don't play it. They set it off. They set Detroit off for the worst riot in American history since the 1863 draft riots. So as a result of Detroit and Newark, but let me be clear, let me be clear. 1967 had 159 different race riots. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. 
I said 1967 had 159 different race riots across the United States of America. Across the United States of America. 159 different race riots by black people in one year. They called it the long hot summer. They called 1967, the year before they killed King, the long, hot summer. And one of the reasons they had to kill Dr. King the next year, one of the reasons they had to kill Dr. King the next year, one of the reasons they had to kill Dr. King the next year is because Malcolm was dead. So all the youth who followed Malcolm was now looking to King. The Black Panthers was just getting started. The Black Panthers was just getting started, but Dr. King was already established. So all the youth who followed Malcolm were now looking towards King. So Dr. King go and visit the most honorable Marcus Garvey grave in Jamaica. Dr. King goes to Jamaica and visits the grave of the greatest organizer in modern history, His Excellency, the most honorable Marcus Garvey. He comes back from Garvey land. Dr. King comes back from Garvey Garvey land and he starts sounding like Marcus Garvey. Listen to dark listen to Dr. King last year. Listen to the Dr. King of 68. Listen to the Dr. King of the late 67s. That was Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X channeling through Dr. King. That was Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X channeling through Dr. King. And you had all these youth who was rebelling against the white power structure in 1967, 159 different black race riots. The government was afraid that Dr. King was going to mobilize all these black youth. 169 cities. The government was afraid that Dr. King was going to mobilize these youth. And that's why Dr. King had to go. He was the black Messiah. He was the black Messiah that J. Edgar Hoover and the CIA and the FBI could not let happen. And that's why they had to kill Fred Hampton the year after they killed King. That's why they had to kill Fred Hampton the year after they killed King. That's why they had to kill Fred Hampton the year after they killed King. Because once they killed King, Fred Hampton was next. And Fred Hampton has just gotten elected by the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party to be the national spokesman at 21 years old. Fred Hampton was going to be the national spokesman. So they killed Malcolm, killed King. Then they had to kill Fred. Why? Because they didn't want the rebellious spirit of African youth to get leadership. They didn't want us to organize the rebellious energy of black youth. They didn't want us to organize the rebellious energy of black youth. They didn't want us to organize the rebellious energy of black youth. Now pay attention to what happens next. During 1967, 2,100 injured, 11,000 arrested. 2,100 injured, 11,000 arrested. Lyndon Baines Johnson said, I got to do something about the black revolt. We killed Malcolm and they still at it. We killed Malcolm and they still at it. We killed Malcolm and Malcolm's spirit went into the youth in the inner cities and they rebelling all over the place. They rebelling all over the place. We got King running around, sounding like Garvey and Malcolm. We got Huey and Bobby Seale running around on the West Coast. We got to do something about this. And in retrospect, brothers and sisters, in retrospect, brothers and sisters, I wish the Black Panther Party could have united with Dr. King on some level. In retrospect, I wish the Black Panther Party could have united with King on some level. On some level, I wish they could have been able to achieve a degree of operational unity because if Dr. King and Huey and Bobby could have just united on a certain level, it would have made Dr. King more legitimate to the grassroots and it would have made the Panther Party more legitimate to the bourgeois Negroes just enough, just enough to get some things done. See, Malcolm and King were going to come together. Malcolm X and Dr. King 
were going to come together. This is why Malcolm had to die on February the 21st. This is why Malcolm had to die on February the 21st. Because Malcolm had met with Coretta Scott King. Malcolm X went south and met with Queen Mother Coretta a few weeks before Malcolm died. Dr. King was in jail. And through Coretta Scott King, Malcolm and Martin were going to come together. Malcolm was going to run the north. Dr. King was going to run the south. Malcolm was going to run the north. Dr. King was going to run the south. And they couldn't let Malcolm and Martin come together. So Malcolm had to die on February the 21st. For number one, he had to die before King got a chance to connect with him. They needed Malcolm dead before King had a chance to connect with him. Number, mm -hmm. number two, number two, Malcolm was supposed to keynote a third world revolutionary leaders conference outside the country with Shea Guevara. Malcolm was supposed to keynote a third world revolutionary leaders conference with Shea Guevara. Malcolm X in the spring of 65 was supposed to keynote a revolutionary leaders conference with Shea Guevara, okay? And the third reason Malcolm had to go, according to all the research I've got, was some of his enemies within his former organization needed him dead before Savior's Day the following week. According to the research, all due respect, some members in his former organization needed him dead before Savior's Day the following week. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave it at that. Now, on July 28th, 1967, on July 28th, 1967, Lyndon Baines Johnson commissions a National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. On July 28th, 1967, Lyndon Baines Johnson commissions a National Advisory on Civil Disorders, popularly known as the Kerner Commission, to create the study of the causes of the 1967 riots. This is important, brothers and sisters, to understand why Dr. King was murdered. This is important, brothers and sisters, in order to understand why Dr. King was murdered. This is important, brothers and sisters, in order to understand why Dr. King was murdered. The Kerner Commission pissed President LBJ off. The Kerner Commission actually undermined the white power structure. If you haven't read the Kerner Commission, order it right now. Get on Amazon and order a copy of the 1967 National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. The book is like 500 pages. You got to read it. They told the truth, brothers and sisters. That commission that LBJ put together, he didn't think they were going to tell the truth. They told the truth, and that report concluded that the racism in America, the ghetto, they said the ghettos of America, and the conditions that gave forth to the 1967 riot was created by white people, perpetuated by white people, and maintained by white people. Get the Kerner, come on, get the report. They said the riots in Detroit and the riots in Newark and the riots in the other 159 cities was created by the white folks. White people created the conditions, poverty, unemployment, drugs, police brutality, lack of opportunity. They said the government created it. The government perpetuated it. The government maintained it. Guess what? LBJ never acknowledged the Kerner Commission. President Lyndon Baines Johnson was pissed off. And if I'm not, if I'm not uh, mistaken, he fired. He fired some of the commissioners on the report because he didn't expect them to tell the truth. They, the Kerner report basically said white supremacy caused them riots in 1967. The Kerner report basically said 
white supremacy created the riots of 1967. And guess what? It's a government document. The Kerner Commission is a government document. So let me ask y'all a question. How you doing, wifey Octavia? That's my Facebook wifey. Everybody say good morning to Sister Octavia Carter. That's my Facebook wifey. But check this out. The Kerner Commission report is an official U.S. government document, right? The Kerner report is an official U.S. government document. So can I ask you a question? If the Kerner Report is an official U.S. government document. If the Kerner Report is an official U.S. government document. Can you help me understand why President Obama never refers to it when dealing with the problems affecting black people? Why didn't Bill Clinton ever refer to the Kerner Commission report for the problems affecting black people? George Bush, Senior or Junior, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, the Congressional Black Caucus. Can somebody tell me why there's a book this thick explaining the problems of black people in America, an official government document this thick, the Kerner Report of 67, and no president ever talks about it. No black elected official ever talks about it. Nobody on the Congressional Black Caucus ever talks about it. The NAACP don't ever talk about it. The Urban League don't ever talk about it. The black church don't ever talk about it. You got a whole book detailing what America did to black folks and how America perpetuates it. Systemic research. Systemic research. Systemic research. And you never hear anybody talk about the Kerner Commission report. Can somebody tell me why not? We hear about the rainbows and we hear about the Afghanis and the Mexicans and the Arabs and the Chinese and this and that. Why nobody talking about that Kerner report? You know why nobody talking about that Kerner report? You know why nobody talking about that Kerner report? Because they don't want to face the facts. The Kerner report is incontrovertible, irrefutable evidence that the U.S. government created the ghetto. The U.S. government created the ghetto. It is called the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. And the reason they had to kill King, because with that book, with that book in his hand, with that book in his hand, Dr. King had the weapons he needed. With that book in his hand, Dr. King had the weapon he needed to scientifically and methodologically convict the U.S. government for crimes against humanity in the form of African people. Dr. King had to die. You could not give Dr. King the Kerner Report and think America was not going to change. Dr. King would have took that book and used it as a weapon of mass destruction and a weapon of mass construction. He would have used that book to lead the greatest economic revolution in American history, brothers and sisters. Now, everybody know the first black Supreme Court justice was who? The first black Supreme Court justice was who? The first black Supreme Court justice was Thurgood Marshall. When was Thurgood Marshall sworn in as a U.S. Supreme Court justice? When did Thurgood Marshall become the first black Supreme Court justice? October 2nd, 1967. Nat Turner's birthday. On Nat Turner's birthday. On Nat Turner's birthday. Thurgood Marshall became the first black U.S. Supreme Court justice in American history. No disrespect to Thurgood. No disrespect to Thurgood. No disrespect to Thurgood because he was a legal mastermind. The way he destroyed legally school segregation in the landmark Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision. Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston, they legally destroyed the white supremacist argument 
against school desegregation, right? No disrespect. His wife was not African. No disrespect. Thurgood Marshall had the snow bunny crisis, but I still honor him for the work he did in the landmark May 17th, 1957 Supreme Court justice. But here's the point. In order to appease black people, in order to appease black people after the long hot summer of 1967, in order to appease black people after the long hot summer of 1967, the federal government made Thurgood Marshall a Supreme Court justice because they wanted black people to think things were gonna change. When did this happen? Again, let me say it again. Thurgood Marshall does not become Supreme Court justice by accident. Thurgood Marshall does not become Supreme Court justice by accident. Thurgood Marshall becomes a Supreme Court justice because Lyndon Baines Johnson didn't know what else to do. Black youth were taken over the inner cities. Detroit and Newark were off the hook. So he said, what can we do to calm these black people down? And somebody said, make Thurgood Marshall a Supreme Court justice. Make Thurgood Marshall a Supreme Court justice. They would do the same thing in 2009. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, they would make Barack Obama. A few years after Hurricane Katrina, they would make Barack Obama. A few years after Hurricane Katrina, they would make Barack Obama president of the United States to make black people think America is getting better. When you know your history, you will not repeat it. When you know your history, you will not repeat it. When you know your history, you will not repeat it. Thurgood Marshall was used as a token. Thurgood Marshall, the great Thurgood, who I love and respect, great ancestor, but they used him as a token to try to calm black people down after the long, red, hot summer of riots in 1967. And then three weeks after Thurgood Marshall becomes Supreme Court Justice, three weeks after Thurgood Marshall becomes a Supreme Court Justice, Huey P. Newton gets into a gunfight with Oakland police. Huey P. Newton gets into a gunfight with Oakland police. One officer is murdered and another officer is injured. Huey P. Newton is taken to the hospital and he is chained to a bed and a reporter walks into the hospital room with a late great doctor. Huey P. Newton is chained to a bed and the reporter watches the police beat up on a shot and injured, handcuffed to the bed, Huey P. Newton. Yes, that was October 28th of 1967 when Huey P. Newton was accused of killing a cop, was shot himself during a police altercation. He would ultimately win the case. And then four months later, February the 8th of 1968, historically black college and university students, listen up. February the 8th of 1968, at a historically black college, South Carolina State University, HBCU, South Carolina State University, HBCU, South Carolina State University, February the 8th of 1968. Three students were shot and killed and 37 black students at South Carolina State injured by South Carolina Highway patrol police, and military. After a protest gone wrong at a local bowling alley notoriously called the Orangeburg Massacre. 
our revolutionary African students at South Carolina State University. Our revolutionary African students at South Carolina State University. February the 8th, 1968, decided to go and protest. I believe it was segregation or mistreatment at the White Bowling Alley. They went to protest segregation and mistreatment at the White Bowling Alley in Orangeburg, South Carolina. They protested. Went back to the campus, protested. The white police show up with a couple coons. The white police show up and they open fire on the campus of South Carolina State. They open fire on the campus, South Carolina State, on February 8th, 1968, killing three students and injuring 37 others. It's called the Orange Birds Massacre, and they have a monument on the campus. There's a monument on the campus of South Carolina State University. I spoke there. One of my largest audiences of all time, jam-packed for the Prince of Pan-Africanism. South Carolina State showed up and showed out for Dr. Umar a couple years ago when I spoke on campus at South Carolina State. To my HBCU students, don't wait to the last minute to put in your speaking requests with Dr. Umar for Black History Month. My HBCU students and my PWI students, my HBCU students and my PWI students, don't wait until the last minute to put in your speaking request for Dr. Umar to come to your campus and bless you with the wisdom of the ancestors, February of 2022. So that was February the 8th. And then on February the 29th of 1968, pay attention to the dates. Pay attention to the dates. Is that Sister Shana et Tayin? Shout out to Sister Shana et Tayin. Listen, Dr. King is murdered April the 4th. The Kerner Report comes out February the 29th. Stay with me. The Kerner Commission's final report comes out on February the 29th. Last day of black history. Last day of black history, right? You have the whole March. How many days in March? How many days in March, y'all? Let me see. Let me see how many days in March. 31 days in March. The Kerner Report comes out on February the 29th of 1968. There's 30 days in March. Four days in April, Dr. King would live. Dr. King was murdered 34 days after the Kerner Report was released. Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee in a conspiracy planned by the FBI, the CIA, the Ku Klux Klan, the Memphis Police and Fire Department and some coons in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in some coons in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King was murdered at the uh, Divine Lorraine Hotel 34 days after the Kerner report was released. Why is Dr. Umar bringing this up? The reason I'm bringing this up, brothers and sisters, is they had to kill him. They could not let Dr. King get that book. The U.S. government cannot let the preeminent leader of black people get his hands on that Kerner Commission. He died 34 days after the report was released. They basically gave him a month to live once that report was released. And let's listen to what the report said. 462 pages. 400. No, the man who shot King was a sharpshooter for the Memphis Police Department. The man who murdered Dr. King was a sharpshooter for the Memphis Police Department. The man who murdered Dr. King was a sharpshooter for the Memphis Police Department. But listen to what the Kerner Report said. It concluded that the 1967 riots with Newark and Detroit being the worst. Listen to this quote. I'm quoting the Kerner Report. I'm quoting the Kerner Report. Black frustration due to a lack of fair housing, education, social services, and a racist media. Listen, brothers and sisters, understand, overstand, and understand what Dr. Umar is telling you. 
understand, overstand, and understand. The, I'm, I'm quoting the 462-page Kerner Commission report that exposed white supremacy and led to the death of Dr. King. It said, quote, black frustration due to a lack of what? Fair housing, education, social services, and the racist media. Fair housing, education, social services, and the racist media. Thank you. You're me Yahoo love. You're me Yahoo love. Thank you. Has it changed at all, brothers and sisters? Has it changed in 50 years, brothers and sisters? I'm asking y'all a question. Has it changed in 50 years? Are we still not frustrated due to a lack of fair housing, gentrification, education, special ed and ADHD, social services, homelessness, job employment, and the racist media? Has it changed? That's why we need to use that Kerner report. We need to demand that Joe Biden read the Kerner report. Kamala Harris, read the Kerner report. Congressional Black Caucus, use the Kerner report. Black frustration due to a lack of fair housing, education, social service, racist media. Number two, I'm quoting number two. White institutions created it. White institutions maintain it. White institutions condone it. They didn't say gangster rap. They didn't say sagging pants. They didn't say single moms. They didn't say incarcerated fathers. They said white institutions created it. White institutions maintain the problems in the ghetto and white institutions condone it. Next quote. Kerner Commission said, the nation is moving into two societies. The nation is moving into two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Has that changed, brothers and sisters? It was written by a group of scholars. Most of them were white with a few blacks. Most of them were white. It was a group of scholars, a commission of experts in criminology, psychology, economics, criminal justice, everything. A whole team did research and they went around to the cities where the riots happened and they talked to the people. They looked at the history, the government, they studied the research. This was research by the government that says racism was condoned by white institutions, created by white institutions, maintained by white institutions. And the solution, listen to the solution. Listen to the solutions. Y'all ready for the main solution? The main solution to deal with crime and delinquency and lack of opportunity in the black community was what? The government must create jobs for black people. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. The number one solution Black people need jobs. You want them to stop doing drugs? You want them to stop selling drugs? You want them to stop running guns? You want them to stop gang banging? You want them to stop going to jail? You want to end homelessness? You want to keep the fathers in the house? Give them jobs. Has they have, have they done anything about jobs for black people? I haven't heard nothing from a president since I've been alive. I haven't heard a single president in my life, I haven't heard a single president in my life say anything about creating jobs for black people. But they creating jobs for Mexicans. They creating jobs for Afghanis. They creating jobs for Mexicans and Afghanis and Arabs and all these other refugees. No jobs for black people. No jobs for black people. When they talk about crime, they never talk about jobs. In Chicago, they talking about crime. In Philadelphia, they talking about crime. In Detroit, they talking about crime. I ain't heard the word job yet. I ain't heard the word job yet. When are they going to start talking about jobs? You have to give black people the ability to raise money so they can build their lives and build their businesses. Nobody, Obama ain't say one word about jobs for black men. Obama ain't say one word about jobs for black men. 
but he put over 100 rainbow gangers in federal jobs. He, point, he, he, put, he appointed more than 100 rainbow gangs to federal jobs, Barack Obama did. And he is a hero to black folks. Lord have mercy. Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. And then they said, you must listen to the second solution. First solution, create jobs. Second solution, diversify the police department. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Diversify the police department. Have they diversified the police department? In some places, not in most. In a lot of predominantly black cities, you have more than 90% white police in predominantly black cities. 90% white police in a predominantly black city. If the Kerner Commission said you need to diversify the police, why are the police majority white in a majority black city. Why are the police majority white in a majority black city? Why are the police majority white in a majority black city? Lord have mercy. I'm going to end this installment of Black America after Dr. King by saying this. On March the 12th, 1968, the African island of Mauritius gained its independence from Britain. Shout out to all my Mauritius Africans. Shout out to all my Mauritius Africans. Shout out to all my Mauritius Africans. Independence Day, March 12th. But on April the 4th, 1968, April the 4th, 1968, at 6.01 p.m., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. walked out onto the balcony of the Divine Lorraine Hotel, black owned in Memphis. And within minutes, a sharpshooter from the Memphis Police Department would almost take his life. But Dr. King would arrive at the hospital with a bullet wound to the head alive. But he would be suffocated by police and doctors with a pillow inside the hospital until he died. And we know this because a white nurse, we know this because a white nurse, we know this because a white nurse witnessed Dr. King being suffocated in the hospital by white police and white doctors until he died. According to William Pepper, the King family attorney, in a book called The Plot to Kill Dr. King, you must read it. Google William Pepper, like salt and pepper. Google William Pepper and read his books on the assassination of Dr. King. According to him, according to him, the good Reverend Jesse Jackson, Intentionally or inadvertently, according to him, the good Reverend Jesse Jackson was an informant in the FBI for the FBI who provided intelligence to the authorities that gave them information they needed to carry out the murder of Dr. King. Now, Reverend Jackson is dealing with COVID right now. I hope he recovers because I don't know absolutely if he was an accomplice in the Dr. King assassination. I don't know if he was absolute. But it sounds like he had knowledge that King would die that day. And he did nothing to stop it. We also know that there was a group of brothers in the community who were there to defend Dr. King's life. There were a group of brothers who were there in Memphis to defend Dr. King's life and Reverend Jackson told them that their services were not needed. Reverend Jackson told them their services were not needed. Reverend Jackson told them their services were not needed. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters,
brothers and sisters. I'm not even halfway through. We ain't even hit the 70s yet. You know what? I might take you up to 1970 and stop at 1970. Maybe I should take you up to 19. No, this is 68. Yeah. Maybe I should take you up to 1970. Oh, man. I got like 10 more pages of 1968. I got 10 more pages of notes. I got 10 more pages of notes for 1968. Intellectual Ifa Tune Day. I got 10 more pages of notes. I'm going to have to come back. I'm going to have to come back. I'm going to have to come back. I want to say this. When I read our history and the people who struggled and sacrificed and stood and fought for us, I am so humbled and so honored to be here to carry on the legacy and the life work of those who came before me. And I want you to be the same way. I am humbled and honored. I We are the inheritors. We have an inheritance, brothers and sisters. We are the children of the Ma'afa. I am the descendants of those who came on slave ships. I am the descendants of those who fought in the Civil War. I am the offspring of Douglas and Tubman and Ida B. Wells and Fannie Lou and Mega and Fred Hampton. I inherited their struggle, brothers and sisters. I inherited their struggle. And I have a responsibility, and so do you. To keep the torch lit, keep the fire of African liberation burning, keep the flames of Pan-African revolution alive. We have a responsibility to finish the work of Dr. King, finish the work of El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Finish the work of Kwame Nkrumah and Patrice Lumumba and Sekou Toure and Amaka Cabral and Deedon Kamathi and Menelik II and His Majesty and Prahali Selassie and Winnie and Nelson and Chris Ani and Steve Biko and Robert Sabukwe and Shaka Kasensa Kagona Zulu and Maurice Bishop and Peter Tosh and all the great African activists. I am honored to be an African. Indigenous is an adjective. Indigenous is not a noun. Do you understand? The word African is older than the word indigenous. What am I calling myself indigenous for? That's a white man's word. My ancestors never called themselves indigenous, but they did call themselves African. Brothers and sisters, I'm proud to be African. I'm not ashamed of nothing my people been through. Because we fought and we won and we overcame it. I'm a chain. You are a chain in the link of great African ancestors. Brothers and sisters, you are a chain in the link of great African ancestors. Brothers and sisters, you are a chain in the link. If you look at your DNA under a microscope, it looks like a chain. Do you know what that means? Why does the DNA in your body, in your blood, look like a chain? The DNA sequence looks like a chain because we are chained to our ancestors through a blood oath. Blood in, blood out. You have an oath with your ancestors that you don't even know about. Brother C. Jai, you're wrong, brother. You are ignorant and you are misinformed. 
Africa was not named by its conqueror because no man ever conquered the whole continent. Name me a white man who conquered the whole continent. I'm listening. Alexander the Great conquered Kemet. Caesar conquered Kemet. Name me the white man who conquered the continent. You can't name one because no one white man conquered the continent. Leo Africanos never conquered the continent. The word Africa was around and is older before Leo Africanos. It is from the ancient Kemetic language. Af-ra-ka. Ra-ka. Af-ra-ka. Ra is God. Ka is spirit. Af is from. When we say we are African, an original comedic word, we are saying we are from the spirit of God. African means I am from the spirit of God. African means I am from the soul of God. African means I am one. I am the original man. I am the original woman. I am not from Asia. I am not Asiatic. I am not Mexican. I am not Moroccan. I am not North American. I am an African. Take that self-hating Bull crap y'all teaching our children and keep it to yourself because we ain't teaching that crap at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. We ain't teaching those lies at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. We do not come from Asia. We come from Africa. We do not come from Mexico. We come from Africa. We do not come from North America. We come from Africa. I am an African. And the word African is older than the word Asia. It's older than indigenous. It's older than sovereign. It's older than Mexico. It's older than every word that the mother Negroes use to try to steal you away from your birthright. That's right. I civilized Mexico, but I'm from Africa. I civilized North America, but I'm from Africa. I civilized Spain, but I'm from Africa. I civilized Asia, but I'm from Africa. The greatness of Garvey, the greatness of the most honorable Marcus Garvey is Garvey organized us not with self-hate, not with fake religion, not with false scruples, but he organized us with African consciousness. Garvey organized us with African consciousness. Brothers and sisters, I will be in Allentown, Pennsylvania on Saturday, October the 23rd. If you have any middle schoolers or high schoolers, if you have any middle schoolers or high schoolers, if you have any middle schoolers or high schoolers, whether you live in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, if you want to bring your children to the youth explosion, I will be speaking to the youth on Saturday, October the 23rd at the South Mountain Grove, 400 East Mountain Road in Allentown, Pennsylvania. You understand? The event is free. If you want more information, we can call 484-375-7753. If you need more information, you can call 484-375-7753. You can text my phone for the flyer, 215-989-9858, 215-989-9858, This Saturday, Allentown, PA. If you need a copy of my book, you can come get it from Allentown. If you need a copy of my book, you can come get it from Allentown. For those of you who have ordered the book, books are being mailed every day. Be patient. Books are being mailed every day. Be patient. Books are being mailed every day. Be patient or come bring your receipt to one of my lectures and pick up your book. That's all you got to do. Dr. Umar will be in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Thursday, November the 4th. Dr. Umar will be in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Thursday, November the 4th. Dr. Umar will be in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Thursday, November the 4th. Dr. Umar will be in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Thursday, November the 4th from 2 until 8 lecture Q&A book signing. Chattanooga, we will be at 1403 Tunnel Boulevard.
Chattanooga, Tennessee, 1403 Tunnel Boulevard. Chattanooga, Tennessee, 1403 Tunnel Boulevard on November the 4th from 2 to 8. More information, 423-642-9393. 423-642-9393, Chattanooga. Text message only. Black Maryland. Black Maryland. Dr. Uma will be in Capitol Heights. Dr. Uma will be in Capitol Heights at the Everlasting Life Cafe with Baba Baruch, one of our master teachers in holistic health and wellness. I will be at Everlasting Life Cafe Wednesday, November the 10th, 6 until 9. Wednesday, November the 10th, 6 until 9. Wednesday, November the 10th, 6 until 9. Wednesday, November the 10th, Capitol Heights, Maryland, Everlasting Life Cafe. You want to get tickets, go to It's a Great Day at EverlastingLife.net. It's a great day at everlastinglife.net, or you can call 301 324 6900. 301 324 6900. 301 324 6900. That's Capitol Heights in Maryland. And then Thursday, November the 11th, the 190th Memorial at Nat Turner Land. Thursday, November the 11th, the 190th Memorial of Nat Turner's Hanging. It's called The Celebration of the Ancestors by Baba Khalifa. Please come on out in Druryville. Go to natturnerlibrary.com. Go to natturnerlibrary.com. Go to natturnerlibrary.com and register. If you've never been on the Nat Turner Trail, you need to experience it. If you never sat in the winds of the Nat Turner Trail, if you've never been to the sacred land, Cabin Pond, where Nat Turner sat down on my birthday, August the 21st of 1831, with Henry, Hark, Nelson, Sam, and Will, and with those disciples, the black Christ declared war on white supremacy and the institution of slavery, and they declared war on everything that was white. And they went from house to house, chopping down the enemies of African people wherever they found them. We honor Nat Turner. This is my 10th consecutive year of being in Nat Turner land on 11-11. This is my 10th consecutive year on going to Nat Turner land. And I want y'all to be with me. Nat Turner Library. Dot com. My first visit to Nat Turner Land was 11 11 11. My first visit to Nat Turner Land was November the 11th of 2011, a week before I got my name from Orisha Orunila, Ifatunde Ogunta Day. I was named by spirit, Ifatunde Ogunta Day. I was named by spirit one week after. I made my first visit to Nat Turner Land. So make sure y'all join me in Nat Turner Land on 11-11. And then join me in Norfolk, Virginia the very next day on Friday, November the 12th. Join me in Norfolk, Virginia the very next day in Norfolk, Friday, November the 12th from 5 until 8. Doors at 4. From 4 until 8, we will be at 1401 Ballantyne Boulevard. From 4 until 8, Hampton Roads, my first visit to Norfolk since 2017, we will be at the Croc Center, 1401 Ballantyne Boulevard, $10 to get in, you can pay at the door. For more information about Norfolk on Friday, November the 12th, you can call 757-761-1092, 757-761-1092. And then on Sunday, my great-great-great-grandfather George Washington Bailey's birthday, the first black public school teacher in Denton, Maryland, former soldier of the Civil War who fought for the liberation of Africans, my three times great-grandfather George Washington Bailey, who was born November the 14th, 1841, 10 years after the Nat Turner War, I will honor him as I host the Black Parent Advocate Lecture and Book Release in Baltimore, Maryland at the Great Blacks and Wax Museum. Baltimore, Maryland, Great Blacks and Wax Museum, Sunday, November the 14th from 2 until 8. I want my Baltimore Africans, my Baltimore Queens and Kings to come on out to the Great Blacks and Wax Museum at 1601 East North Avenue for a free lecture and communication uh, conversation 
and book signing with the Prince of Pan-Africanism on Sunday, November the 4th from 2 p.m. until 8 p.m. Brothers and sisters, Margate, South Florida. If you live in Florida, the Prince of Pan-Africanism will be in Margate, South Florida at the Event Center, 6101 Northwest 31st Street in Margate, South Florida. The Event Center, 6101 Northwest 31st Street. It is going to be a divine celebration of black masculinity. A divine celebration of black masculinity. A divine celebration of black masculinity on Saturday, December the 4th in Margate, South Florida. And then on January the 15th in Minneapolis, Minnesota, we have the Dr. King Birthday Conference, brothers and sisters. The Dr. King Birthday Conference. Sister Michelle, I'm still waiting on a flyer, sister. I'm still waiting on a flyer. I need a hard copy flyer. But we will be in Minneapolis, Minnesota for the Dr. King Birthday Conference. It's time to organize and mobilize. Rest in peace to George Floyd. And then on the 17th of January, I'll be in Scottsdale, Arizona for the first time, brothers and sisters. If you want to take the class for Pan-Africanism, if you want to take the course in Pan-Africanism, send me an email. If you want to be a part of Team Pan-African, send me an email. One to two page autobiographical letter of interest. Who are you? What skills do you have? And why do you want to take the class? Or why do you want to be a part of Team Pan-African? You don't have to take the class. You can still be in Team Pan-African. Okay, or you can take the class and not want to be in Team Pan-African, or you can take the class and want to be in Team Pan-African. Ladies, you got to be natural to be in Team Pan-African, but you don't have to be natural to take the class. Brothers and sisters, hit the Cash App. Our HVAC unit will be installed this month. Hit the Cash App. Our HVAC unit will be installed this month. Hit the Cash App, dollar sign FDMG school. Hit the Cash App, dollar sign FDMG school. Hit the cash app, dollar sign FDMG school. Hit the PayPal, paypal.me slash FDMG Academy. Hit the PayPal, paypal.me slash FDMG Academy, brothers and sisters. Black parents, stop putting your children in special ed. Black parents, stop putting your children in special ed. Black parents, stop getting your children evaluated for ADHD. Black parents, stop getting your children evaluated for ADHD. Black parents, stop putting them on Ritalin. Black parents, stop giving them Adderall. Black parents, stop giving them Concerta. Black parents, stop getting them Metadate. Email address, you can use teampanafrican at yahoo.com. That's panafrican with a C. Teampanafrican at yahoo.com or Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. Either one. Teampanafrican at yahoo.com. Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. If you want to donate to me personally, you hit the cash app at dollar sign Dr. Umar Johnson. School donations, dollar sign FDMG School. Personal donations, dollar sign Dr. Umar Johnson. School donations, dollar sign F Dr. <coughs> Umar Johnson. <coughs> if you need to reach me by cell, 215-989-9858, 215-989-9858. 215 215-989 9858. Peace and Black Power. Part 1, Black America since Dr. King, the 1970s.